Fifteen years ago this week, the first legally recognized same-sex weddings in American history took place right here in Massachusetts. Rob and I would like to welcome our families today that have joined us to celebrate in our legal wedding day. Till death do we part. Till death do we part. The stark marriages came six months after a decision from the state's highest court in the case of Goodridge versus the State Department of Public Health. The ruling was the first of its kind in the U.S. and would be another five years before another state followed suit and another ten before change came to the national stage. In the Supreme Judicial Court decision, then Chief Justice Margaret Marshall wrote, the core concept of common human dignity protected by the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution precludes government intrusion into the deeply personal realm of consensual adult expressions of intimacy and one's choice of an intimate partner. That decision set the stage for two landmark U.S. Supreme Court decisions, which came roughly a decade later, first to repeal the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, which ultimately forced the federal and state governments to recognize same-sex couples married in places like Massachusetts and offer the same tax and legal benefits. And then the court's decision, of course, in Obergefell in 2015, which was celebrated by activists and allies across the country for officially sanctioning same-sex marriage in all 50 states. Ahead of this incredible anniversary, Margaret, Marshall joins me. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Jim. It's great so, to be back. So this Friday on the 15th anniversary, what I'll remember is being across from Cambridge City Hall as the first married couples came out. It was unbelievable. What will you be thinking of on Friday? I'll be thinking about the fact that in the 15 years, is it 15 years? 15 it is. Amazing. I don't think there's been a week that somebody, when I'm in the United States, when somebody hasn't come up to me to say, thank you or I appreciate I, can, I always tell it just happened like two minutes ago somebody comes up to me and I always try to say don't thank me thank the Constitution but that's an extraordinary impact that's an extraordinary impact of one decision speaking of extraordinary impact last time you were here we were talking about this or a couple times ago and you were su you said you were surprised by how big a deal I was. this was is that humility speaking, or did you realize, <laughs> it is, isn't it? Or did you really believe that at the time? You thought this was going to be no big deal beyond our borders? I knew that there was anticipation because my public information officer kept saying, you know, when's this decision coming out? Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, as soon as, soon, as soon as we can get it done. But I didn't expect it to have such an international impact. I mean, you when did that first strike you? When did you first know this is a little bit bigger than I expected? When I opened up the Economist magazine, and there it was. It said, you know, the Chief Justice of Massachusetts, writing for history, said the following. I mean, um, I think I've realized in the 15 years what the impact was. I didn't realize that impact. And the reason why I started by saying not a week goes by without somebody approaching me. And I was in South Africa, people approached me. That you don't have. I mean, even if you're on the United States Supreme Court, I think there are very few judges who have one decision so closely associated with them. And certainly you don't expect to have you know what judicial opinions are, they turgid and you, you know, struggle with legalese and then to find that it's been, you know, the, the words have been read at endless marriage ceremonies. Are you surprised how fast, I, I think how fast we've come, 67% uh, in the most recent poll I saw support same-sex marriage 15 years after the first marriage year. So that's, what does that say about this country, do you think? I think, I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, in some respects, we forget that the first claims, you know, that, that any state denying marriage w were filed 50 years mm -hmm. before the Goodrich decision, and then it just disappeared. I think it says that we learn in this country, we enjoy everybody's success, we enjoy celebrations. I mean, it's a very life-fulfilling occasion. You know, you did a forum last month with Marjorie Egan, my radio co-host. Is it true? I couldn't tell if she was telling the truth to me or not. That you <laughs> told a story that at some forum after the decision, a person asked you whether your husband, your late husband, the legendary writer Anthony Lewis, had written the decision? Yes. What was your reaction when you heard those words? I was insulted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, I mean, Tony was a wonderful writer. Was he ever? So, I mean, there's part of it that says I took it as a compliment. 
but I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I can't it. believe you did. You know, speaking of the Supreme Court, we mentioned Obergefell. The other day, just a couple of days ago, a Supreme Court uh, ruling on uh, a some tax audit case. Here's what uh, Justice Breyer from across the river said in a dissent. It is far more dangerous to overrule a decision only because five members of a later court come to agree with earlier dissenters on a difficult legal question. The majority has surrendered to the temptation to overrule, even though it's a well-reasoned decision that has caused no serious practical problems in the four decades since we decided it. Today's decision can only cause one to wonder which cases the court will overrule next. Later in the same paragraph, he mentioned Planned Parenthood versus uh, Casey. Seem to be indicating to me and almost every other observer, watch out, Roe v. Wade could be next. Do you worry about that too? I do worry about it, but I also understand why so many couples who are same-sex couples come to me and say, do we have to worry about this? What do you tell them? I th tell them no, but I have to say when I see the decision of the court this week, you know, which was a, a, a tedious decision. Mm. I mean, uh, it wasn't tedious from the state court's point of view. I mean, it was whether or not, you know, you can sue one state in another, another state. state. I yeah. mean, I mean, so it's not at all tedious. Right. But it wasn't, it didn't have high emotional appeal. I mean, we are a country that, for better or for worse, tries to lay down the law and to have people follow the law all the time. Now we change our minds. You know, Brown against Board of Education. Why do I raise Brown against Board of Education? This may surprise you. I did not know that on the 17th of May 2004 was the 50th mm -hmm. anniversary of Brown against Board of Education. That was coincidence, total coincidence. But it took a while to overturn Plessy. But if you look at Plessy, which was the one that held that separate um, can be equal, circumstances had changed. And I think what Justice Breyer was saying is there's no reason to change this. Yeah, but can you even? see a day where whether it's uh, uh, Obergefell or Roe v. Wade is reversed? I, by hope, I hope not. I hope not. And then you will have the Massachusetts Constitution. You know, uh, the, there are a number of, uh, roughly about half of the Democrats running for president have said they are either in support of or open to some changes to the Supreme Court. They're worried, obviously, two appointees by Donald Trump, the two oldest members of the Supreme Court, Justice Breyer and Justice Bader Ginsburg, sure. obviously are on the liberal side of the spectrum. The fear is Trump will get at least two more picks. Pete Buttigieg, the mayor of South Bend, was with Marjorie and me on the radio a couple of weeks ago, and here's what he had to say. So the structure of the Supreme Court has been adjusted roughly half a dozen times in U.S. history. I think it might be time to do it again. There are several models for how to do it. The one that I find most intriguing would be to have 15 members, but have five of them chosen only by a consensus of the other 10. Forget the specific plan. Are you open to the notion that the construct of the Supreme yes, Court should I'll be changed? You, yes. Why? The, the most, because I think... And the most important one, I think we have to have mandatory age retirement. Why? First of all, when the constitutions were written, people were living to age 50. Now they're living to 100. I mean, Justice John Paul Stevens is 99. He's just written a great memoir, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he could have stayed on the court. No other country in the world, even the ones that have our model, have justices sitting for that long. Now, I'm not asking Justice Ginsburg or Justice Blyer. I mean, what you have to do is have it feed in. But it works out practically the same thing. If you have everybody retire at the age of 70, 72, I mean, whatever it is, then you don't have this panicked feeling. That's enough of a reform? Yes. And that would not need a constitutional change, or would? It would. Would need a constitutional yeah. change. You know, it, it, what worries you most about, I mentioned Roe v. Wade, and we obviously mentioned Obergefell. Is there one case or one concept that worries you, that you feel is most at risk with this court? What is that? It's not with this court. I think that what this country is facing is unbridled hate speech. That may surprise you. But I come from a country where I know what hate can do. And we have an interpretation from the United States Supreme Court around hate speech, which I think is so inconsistent with what the founders had so? in mind. How so? What do you mean? Because we don't put any restrictions on any kind of speech. We see no competing values whatsoever. Give me an example of something where you think we should put a limitation. Well, for example, the way judges selected in most states... As you know, they have elected judges, and the Supreme Court has said, when you're running for election, you can say whatever you want mm -hmm. to say. You can say, once I'm on the court, I will never approve of abortion. I mean, how can you think of fairness in that? They simply didn't 
balance that with a respect for the rule of law, respect for impartial. I mean, you know, some of the decisions, uh, the decision about saying that anybody shouting whatever they wanted to shout outside the burial of, you know, a soldier who had died in combat for us. Those same people were across the street that night I was across from City yeah. Hall with gay marriage. I mean, the, the founders couldn't possibly have meant that. The founders wanted us to be able to criticize our government. Fine. Say whatever you want to say about our government. You can, you can criticize a decision of the court, but don't think that it's completely unbridled. You, know, you just mentioned your upbringing in uh, South Africa. Obviously, there was apartheid. Norman Mineta was sitting in that chair about a week ago, the first Asian American <clears throat> cabinet member in U.S. history. And he said when he looked at things like family separation, uh, to him, and I'm putting words in his mouth, but this is fair, not much different from internment, uh, which he and his family. Wow. Do you see any similarities between some of the things going on in America in 2019 and some of the things you saw growing up in South Africa? I have to be careful because I'm not pointing those kinds of fingers, but I do think one of the things that concerns me, for example, is the targeted focus on um, immigrants who are coming to courthouses, for example, leaving aside whatever's happened most recently in Massachusetts. We have always, courts have always been a safe ha haven for people who need protection. We have millions of cases in the United States where there's sexual abuse, child abuse, domestic violence, whatever it is. Those people feeling that they're afraid to go to court now, that I don't want in this society. You know, I was listening to some recordings about what happened when we had the terrible famines in Ireland um, in 1848-47, and how many of those people came to the United States, many of them traveling for, you know, walking through County Mayo to get to Dublin, to get on a boat, to go to England, to get here. To think that our country says, once you're here, we're going to you know, find you wherever you are and send you home is just extraordinary to me. It really is. I'm an immigrant. I think people should obey the laws. I don't think I should get preferential treatment. But we have been a safe haven for so long. And the way I think we're dealing with this influx of immigrants at the moment is not the way to go. What is the way to go? That's open to discussion. It's not this way. That's for Marshall, sure. Marshall, thank you so much. Thank you very much. My advice, much. do not be humble this Friday. Is that fair <laughs> enough? Is that a deal?